What's going on, everybody? Welcome in to the Monday, February 5th, 2024 edition of the Daily Energy News Beat Stand Up. Here are today's top headlines. Wind farms are overstating their output and consumers are paying for it. <laughs> Next up, this one's scary, folks. Climate scientists want an umbrella the size of Argentina to block out the sun. Man, I hope this is a parody. Next up, can Germany meet its ambitious energy or wind energy targets? We'll then move on to Orstad. Their strategic shakeup has investors worried. We'll then finish up with an opinion piece by Lori Goldstein out of Toronto. Trudeau government doesn't know how much its carbon tax reduces emissions. Stu will then toss it over to me. I will quickly cover what happened in the oil gas gas finance markets on Friday. We did see oil post really a first losing week, you know, considering a lot of the gains that we made over the past week. We did see rig counts come in, and then we did see Chevron and Exxon earnings drops. We'll do a little compare contrast. And then finally, we'll finish up with actually uh, a little bit of a dive into an, an interview Stu just did with, with, with the one and only Michael Yawn. You can check all that out. On Twitter, as always, though, I'm Michael Tanner, joined by the purveyor of the show, Stuart Turley. Let's get it going. Where do you want to start? Hey, let's start with our buddies over there with the wind farms. Wind farms are overstating their output and consumers are paying for it. Uh, hey, uh, Miss Producer, if you could pull in that picture there, it looks like it's a wind farm that's actually kind of like doing the backstroke. You know, I mean, the Titanic it's, version of uh, wind farms. <laughs> yeah, it's a Titanic. So, it, you know, if you, Michael, if you can't make it work, lie about it. I think this is actually what they're trying to do. Here is where it is. Bloomberg News analyzed 30 million records from 2018 from June to June uh, 2023. They said uh, of the 121 wind farms, uh, 40 overstated their output by 10% or more on average, and 27 of those overestimated those by 20%. Wow. That's some predictions gone wrong. Oh, rut row. I mean, that is absolutely um, spoke. Uh, Fred Olson said statements that the firms were to take compliance with market regulations very seriously. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> the average error should should be close to zero. They should be under. They should be right on the money. This is what's happening, folks. If graft and greed gets into energy. This is where it shows up. Well, I, you know, I come from the oil and gas finance side of things, so I'm very familiar with how things can look great in a spreadsheet, but in reality, not be not have that effect. I mean, anybody can sit down, open up Microsoft Excel and pencil whip themselves a good investment scheme or pencil whip the model to make it seem like, oh, this is a right. great investment versus this is a bad one. If I just carry the four, move where CapEx is coming out, oh, all of a sudden there's free cash flow. And it, it, in reality, you have to understand the business. And that's what's funny. I mean, a lot of this stuff that we're going to talk about specifically in today's show goes uh, goes to show you that people aren't actually modeling the mm -mm. Or, or are just now becoming aware uh, and understanding that the models that they built around these around a lot of this renewables energy goes back to what Warren Buffett said four or five years ago. Well, if it wasn't for the wind tax credit, we wouldn't be building them. Well, I mean that, you know, it's helpful. Exactly. When you're throwing a $10 million tax credit. It's going to make most stuff look profitable, especially when your, your investment threshold is only somewhere between like eight and 14%. I mean, that's not necessarily a big hurdle, right? I think the funny part is, is, you know, I came out and I'll take an L on this one, Stu. I came up out about a month ago and said, Hey, if there's anything that I'm seeing from my vantage point, from the renewable side, that's holding up, it's right. wind, it's offshore wind. That's clearly not the case. We're about to see Orstad. I don't want to tip it off too much, but we're seeing a few things. We, we see ever since I said that, it was also like, oh, well, now here's these 12 articles showing us that it, it's actually could be holding up worse. So I got to take an early L on that one. Um, no, but it, it's pretty funny. Um, so let's go to the next one here, dude. And uh, climate scientist, um, I interviewed a, a, a cool guy. It's we're going to uh, release it here in a little while. He's a data scientist and the data scientists uh, are finding that they have been misrepresenting the numbers in climate 
uh, warming and, and global warming. Stay tuned for that one. But here's another one. Climate scientists warn an umbrella the size of our Argentina to block the sun. I have to give Tammy Nemeth a, a shout out for this. She sent this over and it is a hoot. Dr. Yoram Rosen, a physics pr professor at the Asher Space Research Institute at Technical Israel Technical Institute of Technology is leading the team of scientists we can show the world, look, there's a working solution in case it's to increase it to the necessary size. Well, let's be clear here. So what exactly do they want to do here? So the underlying idea is that they're going to take these huge, you know, they call them parcels, but they're basically things that are somewhat transparent that can be positioned somewhere in space to attempt to marginally reduce the intensity of the sunlight, therefore, quote unquote, mitigating the threat of global warming. But here's 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 what you got to realize in order to block out enough radiation, a single sunshade, the single sunshade, we need to be approximately the size of Argentina. Really, it's one million square miles, weigh two point five million tons so that si and, and, and so they're attempting to see if this idea could work on a hundred foot square. And it may only the hun the hundred square foot prototype is going to cost between 10 to 20 million dollars. I mean. I'd like to get on that bill of materials. When, where can I put in a bid for that? What this is, is a continuation of the climate scam wealth transfer is all that is. They're going to be getting handouts and that's all, that's all that that is. When you take a look at being able to put that out in space, guess where this episode was, uh, uh, ep uh this was an episode out of the Simpsons. And it is now real. <laughs> yeah, it's it's absolutely insane how much they are are going for. But you know, they're estimating that a full size product would cost trillions of dollars. And it's I mean, what what's hilarious is is this is what we're spending our time. You know, this is what we're spending with the limited intelligence that the human species has left. I mean, it's it's small. The limited right. amount we've got left, we're spending it on, we need to build something to block. I mean, this is literally, this is stuff that, like you said, it's out of the Simpsons. It's something I'd expect it, to see the Babylon B write about. It, but it, now, now all of a sudden it's, it's real. And we're, and, and, and if you're in Israel, your hard earned tax dollars are, are going towards it. Oh, I think it's just despicable. Um, I'd rather feed, I would rather put the trillions Let's get all the energy, low cost energy to Africa and let's elevate several billion people out of poverty. That's where I would rather go. All right, let's go to the next one. Germany. Can Germany meet its ambitious wind energy targets? This one's pretty tough, Michael. Um, they're doubling and tripling down on stupid. Not only did they kill their last two nuclear reactors in the past six months, if we manage to achieve what we set out to do, this is a quote, uh, German Chancellor Ulf Schloch seems optimistic about governing his coalition. He says, if we manage to achieve what we set out to do, I am confident we will then break with 200 years of industrial tradition and prosperity built on Coal, gas, and oil," said Schultz, speaking in in Potsdam. Is, is that Sergeant Schultz? From I think Hogan's he, Heroes. It's his great grandson. I think oh. it's. I see nothing. They're both, but, but both money, not seeing anything. No, but money in my pocket. Currently, around thirty percent of Germany electrician electricity is generated by burning coal and gas. Wind turbines, meanwhile, generate. Almost half the country's power, but their price is the highest in the world, and they've lost more GDP than just about anywhere else. So far, some 1,500 turbines uh, up 300 meters, nearly 1,000 feet tall have been installed out at sea. Now they're trying to increase it. Well, and 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 this this article also points out something that that someone like if you're going to go all in on wind energy, fine, you're going to have to do it. You're going to have to do it offshore because there's just so many limited locations. The issue is not, and this is where a lot of where my my analysis went wrong. 
The issue is not, and this article brings that up, not the actual production of the wind energy. Sure, if you can throw up a wind farm and theoretically spin it 24-7, you might be able to squeak out a 5 to 8% you know, IRR. I don't know what the numbers I'm just throwing out a, a slim margin, something that's barely beating inflation. The problem is getting that offshore, the grid from where it's produced to onshore is absolutely terrible. Exactly. They, 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 it, and, and this article says that, they, you know, in Germany specifically, they estimate that an area the size of 270 soccer fields j- need to be made. Uh, and I don't know what the the, 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 the square mileage on this, probably two, three square miles will soon have to be made in German ports in order to support the wind farms offshore that are already there. So right. it's we've got that. We just can't turn them on because we don't know where to connect them to. Exactly. And uh when you sit back and take a look at the money, he says the money is not going to be there. Let's take Texas. Texas had to spend $3.4 billion to get from the West Texas wind farms, the transmission lines coming in. So just because you think that a windmill is going to be a hundred thousand dollars, but then you try to nobody's also in the U S or in Germany is saying, what about these things when these get decommissioned in 10 years, who's going to get it, uh, you know, the reclamation out of it. Well, speaking of that, we've now got some, I'm I'm teeing up this next article for you. This article actually puts a number on the lifespan. You weren't too far off. Okay. Plus or minus two years on the plus side, but you weren't bad. What's this next one? I'm always, Hey, let's go to the next one here. Orsted strategic shakeup has its investors worried. Um, either, Michael, if you're going downhill, you either just speed up and keep going downhill or you try to hit your brakes and slow down. They don't know what they can do right in here. Uh, the wind farm Orsted will present its new strategy on Wednesday. It faces a serious cutting edge targets either cutting dividends or asset sales uh, or how are they going to price themselves out? So Michael, let's go through some of these numbers here. Let's see here. Um, The numbers, the 50 gigawatt target has to be removed and the market knows it. This is a quote from their uh, financial uh, markets guy. The Bank of America analysis said recommending Orsted shares uh, by arguing the company can avoid the need for new capital by selling half of its U.S. businesses, reducing capital expenditures by 20 percent and cutting dividends by a quarter. Um, Either they're going to have to keep hitting it and really producing it and then keep going, but they're going to lose more money. So do you want to go, uh, this is like the worst Ponzi scheme I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. Keep getting new money so that you can sink it into killing whales and then try to do this. So if they cut the losses, they cut their expenses, they're not going to be a very good investment. Yeah, so they've got their earnings coming up on Wednesday. It's part of the reason they leaked this. You know, if if you're going to have bad news, you might as well leak it prior to the announcement so that when you hear it, you've already settled. And what they did say, and they passed this along, they're now seeing, and and the wind farms they're divesting in, guess, guess what they're selling them at? 12 years. Why? Because the maintenance is coming up. So you were, as I mentioned, you were close, Stu. You were plus or no. minus two years. You were close. But no, it's eight years. And and the the 12 years is when you buy the extra four years of time with the tax incentives and subsidies that are on there. So the eight years is actually the only amount of time those things can actually work. I can guarantee if you took a look at some of those fields, They didn't weren't operating for the first couple of years while they were trying to spin them up and get cables out. So, and and, and remember what, why is there this big shift in strategy? Well, remember, you know, in November uh, or, or, you know, over the last two years, they've set this pretty insane target of 50 gigawatts of renewable capacity. Most (laughs) of that offshore wind by the end of the decade. Now you've got a portfolio manager. I'm trying to find his name here. Um, or, or whoever this person is, but regardless, the quote is the, the 50 gigawatt target has to be removed 
and the market knows it. But they also need to cut their financial goals so deep that it hurts. That's the quote. An investor wants to see them hurt. That When an investor says that, that means things drastically need to change because that's going to cause it, it. Their stock price is going to take a hit. It's not like their stock price with this announcement right. is going to go up per se. It may it, it, it may not continue to fall. It may level out the falling because they, they understand that people are coming out. But this isn't going to hurt it regardless of whether or not they're leaking it now. Oh, absolutely. Uh, they, they need to invest $69 billion to hit that. So, well, I, uh, I, well, I, yeah, I got no, you got no help over here, guys. Sorry. No, uh, it's out of my credit card limit. Uh, let's go to the next one. Laura Goldstein put this one out when Trudeau's government doesn't know how much its carbon tax reduces emissions. You have to buy some serious entertainment on Monday to read this one. Um, our producer, this is absolutely a hoot. You take a look at this guy. He's got the Ukrainian flag uh, that he's in solidarity with. His Canada's Minister of Environment and Climate Change, Stephen uh, Gobert. Uh, so this is uh, this is John Kerry's counterpart. Sure, he's brilliant. <laughs> Sure, he's oh, brilliant. He is. He looks like he um, has got the brain power of a potato bud, but we'll just leave that alone for now. They don't know. And I let me read you some of this in here. Um, he posted Trudeau's radical environment min minister admits the government does not know, does not measure how many emissions are reduced by their costly carbon tax. Why? Because the carbon tax is not an iron environmental plan. It's a tax plan. Well, th this is the quote. So this, this comes from the John Kerry of Canada. Okay. Just to put that in perspective, if <laughs> this is the quote, the government does not measure the annual amount of emissions that are directly reduced by the federal carbon pricing, retroactively attributing specific GHG reductions to a specific action such as carbon pricing, a discrete regulation or a discrete regulation or in a specific incentive is difficult given the multiple interacting factors that influence emissions, including carbon pricing, tax incentive, funding program, investor premises, and consumer demand. And that came out via the National Inventory report this is what the the people who are supposed to be overseeing and understanding at the minute level how their policies are affecting the economy i mean he's literally the minister of environmental and climate change i mean that's i mean talk about waste the environment minister oh, oh I just, absolutely i just threw up in my mouth a little bit but 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 they they don't even know it's insane know. it's actually insane uh, all it is is a wealth transfer again. It's, um, it, it's like a, the government or, or any government coming out and say, oh, well, we don't actually know how much money we've sent overseas to help support this war. Oh, wait, that's the United States, considering we sent an extra six billion to Ukraine. Remember the accounting error? That, that'll be next in, for Canada. They're going to take a playbook out of us and say, oh, well, it was an accounting error plus or minus six billion. Well, that's almost like the accounting error in the uh, uh, Pentagon. They lost $2 trillion, and then the following Monday was 9-11, and then the Pentagon was blown up where their records were. Go figure that out. So here we go. The, 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 the estimate net cost for people living in provinces under the federal carbon tax regime. Okay, so right here. You basically got it starts at $65 per ton of emissions. And then right. the set, and then it, it's going to then increase to 170 come 2030. But what's crazy is if you adjust that for living standards, you're talking it could be $700 in Alberta, $2,700 in Ontario, um, or excuse me, um, 400. Excuse me, it's 710 in Alberta right now. Could go up to 2,700 in 2030. Ontario's 478 could go up to 1800. Saskatchewan 410 could go all the way up to 17,000 or 1700 dollars. Manitoba three. I mean, basically everything's about to triple come 2030. But they don't right. even they don't even know how much it's helping. It doesn't help any. All it does is pass the buck around, and it it again. It's another tax and is a direct in, uh, impacting of inflation and destroying the lower and uh, middle class. Yeah, I mean, you, you said it best. Oh, yeah. 
You got to love today, though. It was fun. <laughs> no, absolutely. Well, be before we move over to finance, guys, we'll quickly pay the bills here. As always, the news and analysis um, that you've been hearing is brought to you by the world's greatest website, www.energynewsbeat.com, the best place for all your energy and oil and gas news. Stu and the team do an outstanding job of making sure that website stays up to speed with everything you need to be uh, need to know to be at the tip of the spear when it comes to the energy and the oil and gas business. Um, you can also email the show questions at energynewsbeat.com you can check us out dashboard.energynewsbeat.com that is our data news combo product really pushing that hard um, here in v1 or in, in q1 q2 so really exciting stuff coming around the corner um, you can email us um, and check out the description below for all of the timestamps, all of the links to the articles that we just heard. Um, and again, you can get in contact with the show there. You can follow Stu and I on LinkedIn, everything in that description below. But let's quickly move over now to, uh, to what happened in the markets. I mean, I mean, Friday with I mean, this week in oil was kind of a bloodbath, Stu, but but we'll start with the overall markets. They actually finished strong on Monday. Um, S&P 500 up a full percentage point, um, pushing all time highs there, 49,000. Or 4,958 for that S&P. NASDAQ actually up 1.7%. We've got a lot of earnings dropping, both in tech and, and, and non-tech. Energy's got, a, we're about to cover Chevron and um, Exxon earnings. But most oil and gas earnings come later in February. You're seeing that the beginning of February, we get a lot of tech, a lot of banking. Um, so that's mainly why we're seeing the NASDAQ run a little bit. Um, uh, U.S. 10-year yields um, up 3.6 percentage points. Dollar index stays basically flat, 0.0% increase. Um, we did see Bitcoin uh, stay fairly flat, still $42,800. Crude oil took about a 2.1% hit. On Friday, down one dollar and fifty four cents, seventy two twenty eight. That's down about five dollars from where it was trading um, just on Thursday. Sitting, or excuse me, on 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 Monday, or excuse me, um, February first. So that would have been Tuesday or Wednesday. Um, it was trading midday overnight. Absolutely insane to just see the absolute just just falling out of the table again we were we were sitting there on tuesday uh a little above 7650 currently as the market closed 7241 the market will open here um in about an hour and a half here as we sit about 415 as we record the central standard time here on uh february the 4th so brent brent what's interesting is brent was only down 70 uh or about a percent or, or a little less than a percent um about a half a percentage point 7834 you know I think really we we saw part of the reason the market was 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 big on Friday, mainly the overall markets, not the oil and gas uh, uh, sector, considering is that we did see some strong jobs numbers um, now or, you know, mainly there was we added a lot more jobs in Friday or on Friday coming out of the U S which is funny because that means that we may not then cut rates. Cause if we're adding jobs and have been raising rates, why would we cut rates when the job of the fed is to support on them is to maintain employment versus inflation. So if we're raising rates and theoretically jobs are coming back, we can debate whether or not we actually believe that or not. But if jobs are staying strong, well, there's no point to cut rates, which is going to hurt overall markets, specifically the U.S. dollar. And then again, the oil and gas, um, you know, we, there, there's some easing tensions going on in the Middle East, despite us or, you know, or, or that's what they say. Again, if you if you if you read Reuters, you know, we did see rig counts drop by two. And it, it's just very interesting. I, I had a lunch about a week, week and a half ago, and we were just we, we were talking about how, you know, this is the exact same macroeconomic factors that we had about a year ago. Take away the, you know, take away, obviously, what's going on in the Middle East. We were sitting about $70 a year ago, and we had 140 more rigs mm -hmm. at the same oil price this year over next. What does that tell you? Well, that just tells you from a macro perspective, people are extremely pessimistic. Whether or not they'll tell you or not, they're pessimistic about where or, who, or, or where oil prices are going. Now, they may... And those are the people that matter. These are the people making the drilling schedules. These are the people expending the capex. They're not too optimistic that prices are just going to run, despite a lot of you know, bloviating by talking heads like Stu and I. You know, we'll tell you oil is going to go to 120. The guys buying the rigs are a little bit hesitant, or we'd see that, or you'd see rig counts higher than last year. If you thought again, if you thought prices were going to go up, and that's your thesis, you should be buying as much 
rig time as you can right now because it's going to go, it's going to just increase as prices go yep. above 90. So it's a little bit of like, you know, hey, prices are going to go up, but we're not really actually going to invest that way. So it's it very interesting. Uh, you know, Canada, we saw two rigs come up internationally. We saw a bump of 10. Um, but what I think the, the, the big thing we saw on Friday specifically was Exxon and Chevron dropping their earnings. We'll start with Chevron, you know, a, a pretty good uh uh, earnings for Chevron, they they popped three percentage points um, up on this news, mainly due to the fact that they had an, a really big um, uh, non-upstream growth in their chemicals business. So, I mean, w w when we look at the earnings between Chevron, Exxon, and those super majors relative to, you know, some of the other all EMP shale companies that are publicly looking, you have to remember that there is a whole nother business or business unit that goes into Chevron and, and, and with Exxon, there's, there's multiple Chevron specifically. They've got a large refining business and that's about 30, 35% of their net income um, specifically comes from their uh, refinery business. So that's a lot of what you're seeing reflected in these numbers here. Obviously, yes, um, upstream did lead the way um, with about $6.4 billion in, in, in fourth quarter adjusted earnings. That came down to um, about $2.3 um, billion in terms of a net number. So, we, you know, you got a net adjusted earnings. You know, just um, vi visit the link, energynewsbeat.com. They'll have all the numbers here, but we'll quickly run through the highlights um this is specifically reported uh reported by chevron so as remember guys there was there was about 1.8 billion dollars of u.s upstream impairment charges that they took that 1.8 billion specifically comes from california and their uh and and their assets around bakersfield they also took a 1.9 billion dollar decommissioning obligation from some previously sold assets in the gulf of mexico so that's your big difference between your 6.4 net earnings and then all at then um what you came out to be or excuse me adjusted earnings at 6.4 billion then your actual reported earnings of 2.3 billion that's due to a couple impairment charges that we just uh went over right there some quick highlights from again they did uh sell some assets in Gulf of Mexico and took some impairment charges in California um you know they set annual records for for net oil equivalent um they went ahead and closed their uh 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 acquisition of PDC Energy, which is a Colorado company. Um, that's mainly due to the, they were that's mainly the reason why they were up four percent year over year. Added a bunch of reserves, again, mainly from that PDP or PDC um acquisition. CapEx, this is interesting, Stu, up 32% year over year, primarily due um to most to to, to an increase in about 500 million of capital invested specifically in PDC assets. Um, a, a lot of that's in Colorado. I mean, it's an interesting part, you know, why is someone like Chevron able to acquire PDC? Well, they have the ability to handle the regulatory environment that's going on there right now. And they, you got to invest a lot of money in there. We, we know a lot about that. They also eliminate about $4 billion of debt and they've actually gone ahead and, and, uh, reduced their debt uh, net debt ratio and retired all of the debt that was assumed via the PDC acquisition. Part of the reason, though, um, we, we saw the stock price uh, increase specifically um, in this go around is that they decided to go ahead and, 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 and release a dividend. That dividend brought the record amount of cash returned to shareholders in 2023. 26.3 billion again that's split between dividends uh and share repurchases which sat at 14.9 billion dollars 33 percent absolutely insane i mean you know we we can talk the merits of share buybacks all we want you know but again here's them coming out we you know we used to talk about this a few years ago nobody was saying they were doing share buybacks they were just they were keeping it quiet they're coming out and saying this um eight percent dividend uh quarterly dividend increase um um, is coming around. So again, that's a lot of what we're seeing in this uh, in this bump. But but all around Chevron, really really solid earnings. You know, the other thing that they finished the year with was that agreement to buy Hess. It's going to really diversify them both in the United States. Gets them into um, onshore specifically. Gets them into North Dakota and the Bakken with Hess being very active there. And then they consolidate uh, their their Guyana infrastructure and their Guyana position. Remember, Hess is the primary non op partner there. Um, with Chevron, go ahead and 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 snatching that up specifically, kind of just goes ahead and uh, kind of locks a lot of that stuff in place. Um, you know, the other four hundred pound gorilla in the room, 
You know, if you, if you thought the earnings for, for Chevron were big, Exxon, they've even got a bigger chemicals business. They've got a bigger refining business. They've got a bigger shipping business. You know, they also have you know, more gas, they got more gas stations that they, that they're leasing their name out to. Um, so they generated earnings of 36.1 billion. Now that's in 2023. So just to give you an idea, um, um, it's in, in fourth quarter, it was 7.7 net earnings. Um, specifically, um, you know, they go ahead and, and I mean, it was an okay, it was an okay earnings report for them. They actually dropped about a half a percentage point, mainly off the fact, um, that they went ahead, um, and, and didn't decide to increase their dividend. They went ahead and just, uh, kept it the same. Um, they did, it, they did, um, announce a, uh, um, uh, that they were going to go ahead and buy back a little bit more of their stock. Looks like I'm trying to find the number here. I think it was in the the, the ten billion dollar range. Excuse me, seventeen point four billion of share uh, buybacks. Um, absolutely incredible. Again, you know that's what the. I mean, you know, if you if you're going to own a super major, you better hope they're giving you a dividend, or else there's no reason to invest in that. Um, you know, a lot of cash flow, thirteen point seven billion dollars. Um, you know they. Yeah, you know, they had two point three billion dollars of asset impairments. Um, but they also, what's interesting is because they have they're, they're such an international business. They, you know, with the dollar relative to the rest of the world's currency, they actually saw an impairment mainly on that currency arbitrage because they try to get a lot of that stuff back into the United States. The other interesting thing that they did was start uh, drilling their first lithium well, which is over there in Southwest Arkansas. Um, Apparently supposed to have a bunch of lithium deposits. We will see. They went ahead and took off, and in the fourth quarter, took off the table, as you guys know, Pioneer National Resources. That was in October of 2023. You know, we'll see if if, if that closes. Well, I mean, we'll see if it closes. It should close in 2024. I've heard some, you know, interesting regulatory news on that. And I don't know if you have any, if you've heard anything, Stu, but I've heard that Pioneer acquisition, it may not be good. Or not that it's not going to be good, but that the the FTC is really looking into it, and oh yeah, they've been oddly right. quiet. We haven't heard anything about it recently. I think it's about to get political. Uh, I think that they're going to start monkeying around with it. So just buckle up. Yep, absolutely. Um, and I, I think it's it's you know again, um, uh, Exxon also has a big position in Guyana. Um, they go ahead and, 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 and not, not, you know, they were the other company that, that, that would have made sense for Hess. I think, you know, it, I love reading the, uh, the merger agreements. Once the merger is official, you have to release kind of a merger agreement where they actually walk through the timeline of the right. M&A process. And then, and there's always company A, B, number C is the company they bought and then D. And there's always these things. My guess is, you know, depending on how many companies they name, my guess is is, is Hess is going to be one of them because if you're Exxon and didn't look at Hess specifically to see if you could tie up against some of that Guyana stuff where growth is really going to now come offshore. I think, you know, a lot of people have come to the conclusion that, yes, there's a lot of stuff to do onshore specifically, but that real huge growth from a production standpoint, it's really going to come offshore if you're these larger companies. Um, So absolutely incredible. Um, you know, you got to remember these guys, uh, Exxon's a lot bigger. They've got, you know, you've got an, they got an upstream business. They call it an energy, they have an energy products business, chemical products business. They call it specialty products. Um, and, and, and that kind of rounds out their business unit. So a lot much, a lot more going on. Um, but you know, good earnings for them. I wouldn't say, you know, Chevron seemed to have come out on top, or at least the analysts liked it better. We saw their stock rise tremendously, but, um, both continuing to truck on, that's really all I've got, Stu. I, I want to hit on something real quick here. You just released actually today, as we record this on Sunday, um, a really a, an episode that's kind of going viral with Michael Yawn. It, 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 yep. it, overview that. Well, where where can people watch that? Uh, I, I released it on uh, X actually, and I did not put it on YouTube. And it's uh, I think at about fifty thousand views, uh, and that's just mm-hmm. within a few hours. Yep. So you sit back and go, that's a two hour episode. Um, Michael Yon is a war correspondent. He and I were talking about the energy on the grid and the crisis at the border. What does that have to do with each other? And it's actually pretty frightening when you consider that uh, the article that just came out, Michael, that we also talked about last week was the FBI head of the FBI saying that the Chinese 
have the capability of remotely controlling and taking the grid down. Mm -hmm. So you add all these things in there that my Arcus, our secretary of uh, uh, Homeland Security, Michael Yon saw him at the Chinese camp. Another article comes through and the ours goes off like you wouldn't believe. People are hungry for that kind of information. No, we, we, it's got over you know 25,000 views, and it's only been up for a couple hours. So we'll highly recommend checking Stu out um, on Twitter. Uh, great follow. I mean, follow him at her. I, 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 I will say, you, you follow him at your behest. Sometimes I got I to gotta not look at his Twitter because it's so, it's so scary. Because Stu's really at the tip of the spear, making sure that you're staying, as again, up to speed. But it can be a little scammy. You, you, you know more than you'd care to know. Sometimes we wish we could just wipe your brain clean and get a fresh slate because you got so much rattling around up there. The only thing about that, Michael, is so many people have reached out to me from around the world to talk uh, hmm. about things. So I have some great resources and uh, my wife has always hear me saying, I wish I didn't know what I know. <laughs> I say the same thing. Sometimes I wish I didn't know any of this stuff, but we've got it. Um, before we go guys next week, February 7th through 9th, we're going to be at NAPE. Really excited about that. We're going to be coming to you um, live Wednesday. I'm not live, but we're going to have podcasts that we're oh, yeah. doing there. Thir uh, Wednesday and Thursday. Um, if you're there, come check and us Friday. out. Booth. Uh, and Friday, um, come check us out, booth 1957. Say you heard you heard about this through the podcast, and, and, and Stu will give you some – Stu will give you a hug. So, actually, you may not want to say that. I'd just lie and say you walked by. I wouldn't want Stu touching me either. But come check us out. It's going to be really fun. We got myself, Stu, R.T. Trevino, um, uh, uh, who's running Pecos Operating. We love them. David Blackman, probably one of the better energy influencers out there right now, specifically talking about all things The Grid. Um, we're going to have lots of other companies. we got lots of interviews going on. It's going to be fun, guys. Really excited. Um, and, and just come check us out again. That's February um, 7th through the 9th. So it's that Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. If you're walking the floor Thursday or Friday morning, check us out. Booth 1957. It's going to be fun. It's going to be a great time. Thank you, Michael. Absolutely. So with that, guys, we're going to let you get out of here. Start your Monday. Hopefully there's only a couple meetings you've got to attend. Don't stab your pencil through your head. Wait to do that till you after you listen to the Michael Yawn episode so at least you can die informed. Um, but then we'll uh, – we'll, for, for those of you who make it through Monday, we'll see you Tuesday, and, and, and we'll, uh, we'll make it happen. So appreciate it, guys. We'll see you tomorrow. Thank <laughs> you.